um, for those who are here for either the first time or one of the first times or weren't here last week or for the last few months, we're still doing this book. And we're on the chapter called Settling Disputes, page 50 and 51 are going to be read today. <clears throat> we'll see if we can get beyond there. Because although this is really wonderful and something very relevant to all of our lives, and the next chapter is even more interesting about uh, establishing an equitable society, which is something that unfortunately capitalism has failed miserably at, and we need to learn how to do, at least within our smaller communities. Um, it would also be lovely at the end of this book to get into some really meaty suttas. So... Um, Anyway, in the meantime, this discussion group continues. So it's not so much a class where the teacher tells you how to understand things and, you know, goes sort of spinning out ideas. It's more something that uh, wants to invite you in to learn to apply these things to your lives and see whether they do apply or not. You know, you can argue with them, you can think about them, you can um, just see how they may be of help and benefit and some guidance in your lives or not. So, um, yeah, just reading out the last of the comments. Grateful to be here. <laughs> nice to have you as well. And we will begin. So this little paragraph is uh, called Settling Disputes in the Sangha. And when they use the word Sangha here, especially with the capital, it means the monastic Sangha. But of course, this can apply to anyone who lives with others, which is most of us, unless we're hermits. And this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 104. So let's see how it goes. And please um, raise your hand at any time. Uh, I might not come to you immediately, but we'll pause at an opportune time. And the same with the people in here. If you want to uh, say anything or ask anything, please feel free. So the Venerable Ananda, who was the Buddha's chief disciple, and the novice Chunda, not Chanda, but Chunda, went together to the Blessed One, and the Blessed One always refers to the Buddha. After paying homage to him, they sat down to one side, and the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, this novice Chunda Bhante says that the Jain teacher Nata Buddha has just died. On his death, the Jains are divided, split in two, left without a refuge. I thought, let no dispute arise in the Sangha when the Blessed One has gone. For such a disciple would be, sorry, for such a dispute would be for the harm and unhappiness of many, for the loss, harm and suffering of gods and humans. So then the Buddha replies, what do you think, Ananda? These things that I have taught you after directly knowing them, and here he runs through some very key teachings. That is, the four establishments of mindfulness. That's the four Satipatthana. And um, straight away, I want to point out that uh, Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Pramali, and me too now I've come to understand, tend to veer away from the word establishments because mindfulness, if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, Mindfulness has to be established even before practicing, directing the mind to those four areas for investigation. So Ajahn Brahm likes to translate that as the four focuses of mindfulness, where you direct your mindfulness to. So that is the body, feelings of body and mind, whether pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. And the mind, qualities of the mind, and also the contents of the mind, yeah? So that's the first key teaching here. I'll just read it in brief and maybe we can go into it more later on. So these things that I've taught you after directly knowing them, that is the four, let's call it focuses of mindfulness, the four right kinds of striving, the four bases for spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, and the seven enlightenment factors and the noble eightfold path. Do you see, Ananda, even two monks or nuns <laughs> who make differing assertions about these things? 
No, Bante, I do not even see two monks or nuns who make differing assertions about these things. But Bante, and Bante means venerable, there are people who live deferential towards the Blessed One who might, when he is gone, create a dispute in the Sangha about livelihood and about the Pati Mokha. Such a dispute would be for the harm and unhappiness of many, for the loss, harm and suffering of gods and humans. I'll just read the next little paragraph. Pati Mokha, for anyone who's not following here, means um, the code of training, let's call it the training, uh, how can we call it? Basically, it's usually what's called the discipline, right? Or the, the rules of conduct, but I tend to think of it more as training in restraint. Yeah. So pati, mocha. Mocha literally means freedom. So these are things that lead to freedom. So a dispute about the livelihood or about the pati mocha would be trifling, Ananda. But should a dispute arise in the Sangha about the path or the way, such a dispute would be for the harm and unhappiness of many, for the loss, harm and suffering of gods and humans. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because here he's almost ranking these two different um, areas that could fall under uh, differences of opinion that people could argue about in some kind of order of importance. And at the moment, nobody's actually quarreling about these things, but the Venerable Ananda's worried that they may when the Buddha's passed away. But here he's saying that as long as you have these basic tenets of Dhamma, the things that basically lead to our awakening and that we can practice, then the other things like livelihood and patimokha, particularly I think related to monastic livelihood and the training precepts or the training and restraint are actually of less significance. Is that what he's saying? Or <laughs> perhaps what he's saying is that if you're practicing the Dharma, truly practicing, then this will be the cause for having good restraint and for being able to upkeep these rules. Perhaps not to the letter, but perhaps the spirit will be there. Because really, the most important thing is to purify the mind. And there is one lovely place in the suttas where uh, a monk comes to the Buddha and says he's completely befuddled and discombobulated by all these different rules, 227 for monks and 311 for bhikkhunis. And he says, I just can't keep all of those. And the Buddha says, it's okay. If you can't keep all of those, just observe one. Just observe the mind which I think is a very beautiful teaching, but of course we have to understand how. So I'm going to come to Diana because there's already um, a question or comment here and it always enriches the conversation very much. Can you unmute? Or am I the unmuter today? I'll, I'll unmute people. It's easier. Did you get a message? I'll give you another Oh, oh, sorry, I muted you again. <laughs> we'll get the hang of it shortly. How's that? Hi, great. I can hear you. Um, Hi. Greetings, Venerable Chanda. So happy to be here. Yeah, it's lovely to have you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the reason the livelihood and the patimoka were put in a separate category, one of the reasons, is because the Buddha understood that times would change. And that perhaps things would be different in the future and call for different nuances yeah. or whereas the path to enlightenment is not changing mm, mm, no matter mm. what happens in the culture or society. That's a very good point. I think you might be bang on. It's certainly one of the reasons. Yeah, it's almost as though the teachings are sort of laws of nature, right? timeless laws like things like impermanence suffering non-self i mean these are principles that are basically part and parcel of existence and they can't really change i used to think you know when i practiced a vipassana meditation you know the only thing that's not per that's permanent is impermanence <laughs> as far as the practice went of course at a deeper level even that um disappears but uh, I think that's a really good insight. 
because the patimoka, the rules of, uh, let's call it again, the training in restraint, they all came about in response to specific incidents that happened during the Buddha's dispensation. And um, even the other day on the retreat with Ajahn Brahm, he was talking about um, the Buddha Kasapa, who I think is one or two Buddhas behind our Buddha, maybe the previous one, actually. I forget. Previous one, right? Buddha Kasapa. And his dispensation didn't last nearly as long as the Buddha's because he didn't establish a Patimoka. He didn't establish the Vinaya very strongly. So it shows that it's not an absolutely essential part of the Dhamma in that, yeah, maybe it's more a convention, something that's relevant to a time and place. And yet at the same time, it does seem to allow for the restraint and the concord perhaps in community that might keep those teachings um, lasting longer in the sense that they can be uh, conveyed, they can be passed on. Um, they can be lived very uh, beautifully in ways that people understand. Um, so, yeah, while it's not absolutely uh, dispensable or indispensable, um, I think it can certainly help the Dhamma, the teachings in particular, to last and inspire the faith of the lay community and the harmony within the Sangha. But, yeah, that's that's a very good point. I mean, many of those rules now are kind of obsolete in the sense that they simply wouldn't arise. Well, we hope they wouldn't, you know, such as throwing the poo over the wall of the monastery. Or <laughs> but sometimes things like, you know, you're not supposed to teach somebody who's holding an umbrella or, or walking barefoot who's not sick. I mean, this is highly unlikely to happen in a, a Western country, you know, where we wear boots and shoes and you know, we don't tend to teach people the Dhamma just as we're walking around. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Oh. Anything else on that? It's quite a, a wide topic. Nothing for now. Anything from the room? All clear enough. Wow. We might get through more than a few paragraphs today. <laughs> okay there are okay so now the buddha is going a bit more deep and saying how um disputes come about so here we're looking a little bit more in depth at people's actual behaviors and attitudes and again how they affect others in the community there are ananda six roots of dispute what six here, Ananda, a monastic, I'm going to say, is hostile, angry and hostile. And then it's taking me back to a different text. Ah, uh, text. What's that say? Eight, eight. I don't know where that is. Mm. Okay, I'm going to skip that unless somebody very kind can find out for me. So a monk is, or a monastic is angry and hostile. One adheres to their own views, holds to them tenaciously, and relinquishes them with difficulty. Such a person dwells without respect and deference towards the teacher, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and they do not fulfill the training. They create a dispute in the Sangha that leads to the harm of many people, to the unhappiness of many people, to the ruin, harm, and suffering of devas and humans. If, monastics, you perceive any such root of dispute, either in yourselves or in others, you should strive to abandon this, let's call it bad root of dispute. Sometimes the word evil is used, but it's got these really Christian con condemning con connotations. So I think the word is papa, which can also mean bad basically leading to unwholesome mistakes. So that this bad root of dispute does not emerge in the future. In such a way, this bad root of dispute is abandoned and does not emerge in future. So this is very lovely, isn't it? Because we're looking at ourselves as well as others. We can see that that kind of behavior, we can see the effect of it on us, but 
that's not enough just to see where other people are obstinate because it's so easy to think that we know and we're right and we're not holding on to our views tenaciously we're just right (laughs) (laughs) people who disagree they're holding on to their views you know tenaciously and relinquish them in difficulty so we have to make them relinquish them but it kind of speaks of you know the arrogance somehow of um, thinking that you know and perhaps the beauty of just living the teachings rather than you know professing to know so many complex things you know it's very easy to speak on the dhamma but how do you actually apply it in your life so Hmm, this is interesting. I haven't actually read this before coming down because we've been so busy with all this property stuff, having found almost an ideal location for a monastery, an ideal property in the last week. So um, you have to forgive me and you have to fill in any gaps. So um, I'll carry on with this bit. How is their removal of a disciplinary issue, so that's when there's been a breach in the Patimoka, in these um, trainings in restraint. How is the removal of that by presence? Here, monastics are disputing. It is Dhamma, or it is not the Dhamma, or it is the discipline, or it's not the discipline. Those monks or monastics should meet together and in concord. Then, having met together, the guideline of the Dhamma should be drawn out. Once the guideline of the Dhamma has been drawn out, that disciplinary issue should be settled in a way that accords with it. Such is the removal of a disciplinary issue by presence. And so there comes to be the settlement of some disciplinary issues here in this way through removal by presence. I'm quite curious as to what you think of this and whether you've seen that sort of strategy work in your lives, coming back to basic principles to abide by, rather than getting into disputing about this is this, this is that, you're wrong, I'm right. I think this is very beautiful. The guideline of the Dhamma should be drawn out. So what does that mean to you, anybody? Will you read that last sentence yeah, again? Yeah, I'll read that again. Maybe I'll read the whole paragraph. And how is the removal of a disciplinary issue by presence? Here, monastics are disputing it is Dhamma, or it's not Dhamma, or it is discipline, or it is not discipline. Those monastics should all meet together in concord. Then, having met together, the guideline of the Dhamma should be drawn out. Once the guideline of the Dhamma has been drawn out, that disciplinary issue should be settled in a way that accords with it, with the Dhamma, in other words. Such is the removal of a disciplinary issue by presence. And so there comes to be the settlement of some disciplinary issues here in this way through removal by presence. I wonder if one of the meanings of presence in this case is the fact that the people are meeting together in concord and actually coming to some agreement on the Dhamma and what it teaches and just bearing witness to that. Mm -hmm. Bringing it back to the basics, you know, to the basic principles. You know, if you have wholesome thoughts, then it's going to lead to wholesome states and it's going to lead to um, concord and harmony. Yeah, Linda. Yeah, it sounds... The, the two parts I'm having a hard time reconciling. Yeah. The, Can you speak up a little bit? Of course. Um, Can people there's, hear? There's two parts that, that feel a little bit disconnected related to what you just said, Venerable. It, the first part sounds a little bit like determine you know, the, the detail of the disagreement in accordance with the framework and the principle of the Dhamma. So does it fit the Dhamma? So that I think makes sense, but then I get confused as to how that is, to your point, quote, presence. You know, it, okay. it, 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 mm-hmm. it feels like it's saying, check it against the principles of the Dhamma. You know, 
you know, when you're looking at a detail of a, you know, a rule or something, but. Right. Um, no, I didn't hear it that way. Okay. Yeah. Maybe yeah. It, it, it's a little. So I heard it as that the Dhamma should be drawn out. The guideline of the Dhamma should mm. be drawn out, not the rule, not the disciplinary issue mm. in and of itself. Yes. I'm sorry. So to it. move away from the, the kind of particular kind of trifling issue because further mm. before that in, in the Sutta, the Buddha was saying that, um, what did he say about issues around the patimoka or livelihood would be yeah. trifling. So I think what they're saying is see it in the context of the Dhamma and the guidelines of the Dhamma. Yeah. And it, draw that out instead. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't say it well, but it, yeah, it feels like a right. forest trees thing. Like look at the, look at the Dhamma. Dhamma. Yeah, exactly. But I still don't get how that applies to quote presence. Right. So yeah. It, it'd be interesting to know the Pali of the word presence. Again, I was wondering if it is the fact that there are many people present Mm. And it's having those many people present and going back to core cool principles that is a good kind of check and balance to see that you are in a, living in accord with the Dhamma, that you have understood it. In the same way, maybe, that um, after the Buddha's Parinibbana, the, the monks and hopefully the nuns came together to discuss the teachings mm. so that they could easily find out if something was you know, going in a different direction and, and root it out and come to some agreement on that. So... I'm not sure, really. I mean, it could also be about being present to the Dhamma principle, mm. um, settling or removing the disciplinary issue by presence. Yeah. Any other thoughts? So we unmute Diana. Thank you, Minori. Um, I wonder what the poly is for drawn out. Mm -hmm. guideline of the drama drawn out because it could mean like teased out of the um the dispute itself like what what issue are we dealing with but i also kind of had a picture of you know gathering the monks together so you have the presence of the yeah monastics and then actually like draw, writing it out of the eightfold path, for example, like mm. really drawing it out okay. <laughs> and then trying to see, okay, so where does this dispute? Is it a question of right view? Is it a question of right lively? You know, what's, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just saw it really literally, but yeah. I, don't know. I don't know. That's lovely. Yeah. Drawing it out. Yeah. yeah. So both would be present. The Dhamma would be present and the, mm -hmm. and the Sangha. And the Sangha. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. Liz. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, I, you know, I've got a, a different reading from that, and I take it from an example. Now I'm retired, and I work for a charity uh, which gives food to people who are broke, and yes. there, there are quite a few of them here as well. And uh, there was a bit of a problem recently, and that fermented lots of uh, bad feelings. And so we had a meeting, and uh, in the middle of all that, and people sulking and being not very happy, I said, well, really, I think we need to go back to basic. What are we here for? Mm. And uh, so we looked at each other and said, well, actually, we're here to feed these people, uh, give them the opportunity to talk about their problems and, and so on. And then once we said all that, the problem was solved. Yeah, beautiful. Because in fact, the problem was just just us having lost from sight, really, yeah. what we were here for. And I think in this particular context, when there is a dispute, it's okay. What are we doing? What is the eightfold path? Yeah. I'm not necessarily having a very intellectual take on things, but am I purifying my mind here? Uh, I, and so on. And I think that's very simple 
maybe too simple, I don't know, maybe it's more complicated than that, but I tend to go for the simple things yeah. in life. Yeah. Um, the less word and the more goodwill you have, the better. That's my opinion. And um, I, when I, you were reading that, that reminded me of that particular thing a few weeks ago, you know, and I thought, yeah, it's going back to the Dhamma, to the um, basic principles. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, one of the translations for Dhamma is basic principles. Oh, well, you see, I, I can translate without even knowing the yes. language. So why listen? not? Exactly. And I think what you said was so beautiful about the simplicity of going back to those basic principles. You know, are we purifying our minds? Because in the end, that's the whole reason that we're here. I mean, we want to, you know, decrease suffering to the best of our ability for ourselves and others and increase a genuine sense of inner peace, isn't it? A genuine sense of contentment and, and value, meaning in our lives. Yeah. And it reminds me a little bit, too, of just something that's happening. Because I think as monastics, too, at least in my life, I try to go back to that again and again to make sure I'm on the right track like I've mentioned the property that we found. Um, and for me and for Ajahn Brahm, it was very clear why we were interested in this place. Shell, who's here today, who came with us. Um, and the, the the area happens to be quite expensive and the house is not particularly cheap, but um, that has got nothing to do with why it's suitable. The suitability is in the accessibility because it's so close to Oxford and also so the seclusion and the peace of the place and as well as looking at it through the eyes of someone who wants to develop a spiritual community to find a good quiet room to meditate a nice welcoming room for the guests who we receive at lunchtime and do the blessings for and dedicate you know special merits to people who are suffering and talk about the dhamma after lunch and you know there was, there's been just a couple of people. I mean, internationally, we've had a tremendous amount of support, but a couple of people noticed that on the brochure there was like a swimming pool and a, a tennis court. And I mean, for us, we just completely overlooked that and it's irrelevant. I mean, it's actually a bit mm. of a because you've got to figure out what to do with it. So then you ask yourself, okay, so what is it that's driving this interest in the place? What is the real purpose of why we're here and why are we building community? And the mm. is, as I say, to have a place where we can practice, that people can come to, that people feel welcome, that's not too complicated. The decor is very, very simple. So I see it for the purpose that it was served and not for all the kind of stuff on the outside. And no. This is our lives, isn't it? We sometimes get lost in the kind of detail and especially with disputes. He said that to the, me and then I said this and what did they mean by it? And yeah, they said this, but what did they really mean? <laughs> And we can forget that we've just gone really off course, you know? Yeah, it's very easy to do, isn't it? Isn't it? And we're doing yeah. it again. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see that dispute, I mean, okay, from an international point of view, that is not even an atom. But it, it has repercussion for lots of people because we, we help a lot of people. And... Uh, uh, when there is an atmosphere between us, between you know, the volunteers, you know, the beneficiaries of all that do feel there is something wrong. And when you were saying, you know, that we don't do any good to and so on and so forth, I was thinking, yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely right, because you feel the discord. Even if no word is said, you feel it. Mm. And I could see that because my job is to make the coffee and the hot chocolate in the morning for <laughs> people who come. I love that That's because awesome. they come in. It's cold now here. And uh, they stop with me. Oh, coffee. <laughs> Oh, mm. your hot chocolate. Yeah. As I said, the chat starts, and uh, so it's a very privileged position. Oh, that's uh, beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. So, Isn't it lovely when we can see service as a privilege? Yeah, oh, well, yes. 
Yes, I mean, I've burned myself a few times with a coffee pot, but never mind, you know, uh -huh. just a smile, you know. We uh -huh. haven't got any heating, so I tell them, human warmth will do the trick today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I can hear it in your voice, the warmth coming out and the satisfaction you get in that role. It's beautiful. It's not what we do, is it? It's how we do it. And it's a kind of cliche to say it, but it's so true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come to a couple of other people, but I'll first read out Benjamin's uh, little note in the box because he said Bhikkhu Bodhi translates by oh ha, sorry, Bhikkhu Bodhi has as by presence. So this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation that we're reading here. So the removal of a disciplinary issue by presence. Bhantisajato translates it as in the presence of those concerned. So he's taking one of those um, nuances that have been um, suggested that presence may mean that the Sangha are literally present. But uh, yeah, I kind of like it left as by presence in a wider way, because then we can maybe add a bit more in the presence of Dharma too. Yeah. Darren, can we come to you? Hi everyone. Hi. Hello everyone. So um I think my view was well my thoughts were similar to uh, I think Hang Liz was um looking at it and um just the simplicity of bring it bringing it right back to the moment and um and the breath and just removing all um egos from it um, and just coming back to what are the teachings and bringing it back to the actual moment um and the breath and the, just that awareness and having that awareness then takes you um into um the dharma and into the noble eightfold path um mm -hmm. and i think it, for me it just feels presence as in awareness and being mm -hmm. completely in the moment because then if i'm completely in the moment um and have that awareness then i can hear what other people are saying um mm -hmm. as opposed to my dogmatic I am right. Um, so that's that, that's how I've been um, viewing it. That's I think. Lovely, yeah. yeah, literally being present in a, in presence. That's beautiful. Yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, I'll come to Pooja. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, I just had a question uh, about uh, when there is a dispute how important is it to have the right view and everyone who's not attained Sotapati is considered to still have wrong views and in the presence of monastics who don't have the right view how can one then trust the judgment of the decision that they arrive at mm. Mm. yeah I mean when it comes to right view again I think there's it's a spectrum it's not that you either have it or you don't it's more that there's a preliminary right view where you start to understand the dharma you start to have a sense of um the fact that your actions have effects and those effects that can actually be experienced by you and by others you know that when we do good we receive the consequences of that and tend to be pleasant consequences that enhance our qualities or the happiness of those around us and when we do things that are motivated incorrectly by greed or ill will or holding on, clinging, um, then it tends to have consequences that are unpleasant in the long term, if not the short, for those around us and for ourselves. So these kind of basic principles, I think everybody can observe. I mean, if we had to have right view before we could start to understand the Dhamma, we'd be kind of doomed, wouldn't we? I think it's a gradual, <laughs> um, it gradually increases as we practice. You know, all the factors of the path kind of roll around each other. And so, insofar as our mindfulness increases, our stillness will increase. Insofar as our virtue increases, that will empower the mindfulness. Um, you know, the more we understand suffering, the more to the world um compassionate attitudes to others so i don't think it's quite as uh, clear cut as that but i do think that you're right in saying we can't trust absolutely what somebody says just because they're wearing the robes or just because even they proclaim to be a string winner 
you have many scallywags proclaiming all kinds of things and um you know we can't really know that for sure and if they're proclaiming it it's unlikely because there's a lot of sense of self there um so i think that's one of the reasons that the sangha are all meeting together in concord because when you have a few people together it tends to give a safeguard as to uh, what the Dhamma really is. Um, and there are inbuilt sort of checks and balances or safeguards in the Sangha itself. One of them being the Patimoka, the, um, the training disciplines or whatever you want to call them. Um, one of the beautiful aspects of that is not just um, the certain trainings that are prescribed, but what you do when you breach them. So you come together and you have to confess, you disclose where you've slipped up and people say, okay, well, you know, what was the context? And they give you some advice and they say, okay, you're forgiven, but try not to do it again. So you are accountable as a member of the Sangha, the monastic Sangha. And I think that is also a safeguard for preserving the teachings as well. And of course we have the word of the Buddha, and that's why I wanted to start these uh, discussion groups, because, you know, the Buddha always says, check out your own understanding against uh, or with alongside the Buddha's word. And if you find that it's in agreement or in, in concord or that the Buddha's word helps you uh, shed light on your experience, then there's a good chance you're on the right path. But if what you've understood is is something else, uh, then maybe there's cause for concern. So. I think it's important to have good teachers. You know, we might not all be areas yet, but there are areas in this world and we can meet them and discuss with them and make ourselves accountable. And that's what I try to do personally. So I have confidence that, you know, if my view is, of course, I'll hear about it. (laughs) And uh, my teachers will help me not only stay on track, but deepen my understanding as well. So I don't know, I think, I hope that makes some sense. I think you're very right to flag it. Um, and we shouldn't take things at face value or, or take the word of someone just because they're in robes, but we should investigate these things for ourselves. And if we find that they lead to wholesome states arising, then there's a good chance of moving in the right direction. Does that make some sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Okay. Anybody else on that subject or another subject? Some people are here in the room. Or shall we even keep going and see where this ends? So you have to excuse me sometimes. I shouldn't say you have to, but please do excuse me, because sometimes these days my eyes are failing me. (laughs) So I might get um, a word or two wrong. Okay. So this is another, so these are the different ways of overcoming disputes in the Sangha. So the first one was removing the disciplinary issue by presence. This is the second one now. And how is there the opinion of a majority? So again, referring back to that safeguarding of of the group. If those monastics cannot settle that disciplinary issue in that dwelling place, they should go to a dwelling place where there is a greater number of monastics. They should all meet together in Concord. Then, having met together, the guideline of the Dhamma should be drawn out. Once the guideline of the Dhamma has been drawn out, that disciplinary issue should be settled in a way that accords with it. Such is the opinion of a majority. And so there comes to be the settlement of some disciplinary issues here by the opinion of a majority. That's sort of clear enough. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And how is there the covering over with grass? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just say this is one that Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali like to quote, Ajahn Brahm especially. Sometimes maybe it's the best. Here, when monastics have taken to quarrelling and brawling and are deep in disputes, so it's gone a bit deeper now, They may have said and done many things improper for an ascetic. Those monks should all meet together in concord. When they have met together, a wise monastic among the monastics who side together on the one side should rise from their seat and after arranging their robe on one shoulder, 
should raise their hands, palms together, and call for an enactment of the Sangha thus. Let the venerable Sangha hear me. When we took to quarrelling and brawling and were deep in disputes, we said and did many things improper for an ascetic. If it is approved by the Sangha, then for the good of these venerable ones and for my own good, in the midst of the Sangha I shall confess, by the method called covering over with grass, any offences of these venerable ones and any offences of my own, except for those which call for serious censure and those connected with the laity. So this is um, more explanation of what we were sort of getting at previously about uh, really being accountable and here to, to a bigger sangha with a wise person taking the lead, somebody who people respect, calling for an enactment of the sangha. It's almost like a special measure. And um, acknowledging, first of all, that they've behaved improperly here and calling out that it would be for the good of those others and for one's own good to actually confess any offences of one's own and of others, except for those which call for serious censure and those connected with the laity. So the serious censure is like uh, things that would call for a bigger, more formal uh, Sangha meeting. So things called Sangha de Cesas, which I think literally means discussion among the Sangha. So that's um, things like masturbation for a monk. And I think, uh, what are the other major ones? that I think robbing a, uh, robbing a certain amount is actually a, um, an offence that's a disrobable offence, robbing over a certain amount. But things like hitting another person. Um, I forget what the other ones are for monks. But uh, they're kind of the most common ones. And then you actually have to kind of stand... Uh, at the back of the line for a while so it's very embarrassing for two weeks <laughs> until you've been kind of on parole you could say and then uh, and then the sangha kind of take you back in if you've abstained from that particular thing so it happens you see sometimes these things happening in the sangha and you think oh dear something must have must have happened there but um, it's very compassionate you know and that there's always a chance to um, to come back in unless you um the, the censure is very serious to the extent that you have to disrobe and that's things like killing um, another human being um, sexual misconduct as in um, sexual conduct and uh, robbing a certain amount of money which is quite a lot and what else I'm very tired so it slips my mind but basically things that anybody would know as improper for a monastic and that would be unethical by the normal sort of standards in the world. Uh, I'll come to Shell now, who also has a hand up. Hi. Yeah, just, hey, um, I was just uh, reflecting when you were speaking through that about how this can be applied like to just general community and yeah, just like from my experiences in communities where there hasn't necessarily been I don't want to say ground rules but you know a set of values and principles to live by and then that causes more conflict and uh, disagreement and then how communities that haven't come across the Dharma but have somehow brought in place things like conflict resolutions or mediated discussions or there was one community I lived in which it didn't really work you passed around a spoon and you just spoke when you had the spoon so you were addressing the spoon which still had to be facilitated <laughs> um and I think this is something that I really like that calls me towards the the Dharma is just having such clear principles and values to live by and mm -hmm. the fact that also their training principles and values for lay people and it's like this aspiration to live well um which i think in a lot of community and that's just I, well you named it earlier about capitalism that's the struggle that we don't have that in communities and we see communities falling apart and individualism on the rise but then it's also interesting in dharma communities how you can come together as a dharma community you actually have 
some very different views and values about the outside world, which also is really nice that politics doesn't really isn't supposed to come into <laughs> Dharma. Common sense should, but yeah. No. Um yeah, I just wanted to reflect. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how politics shouldn't come in. And in a way, maybe these things help. I mean, politics is part of just organizing ourselves as human beings. So you could call this politics too. You could call this democracy, I guess, in the best sense. Um, so in a way, it is a system in and of itself. And I think the Sangha, it's nice that it's so clearly uh, laid down. Um, but still it's a practice and monasteries aren't always uh, harmonious places. But as you say, it's a training, it's a work in progress. And at least we have something to work with there. We have principles that are our guideline and our aspiration, something to really um, work toward. Yeah. Yeah. Covering over with glass. Um, yeah, Shirley just put in another one of the uh, disrobal offences, which is causing a schism in the Sangha. And we discussed that earlier on in this book. It doesn't just mean having an argument or that one ordains for needs and another doesn't. That's not a schism. A schism is something much more serious, like arguing about view. And um, I forget what else was in here. But it's it's really um, a matter of almost going off into different sects so that you're not under the same dispensation, the Buddha's dispensation anymore. It's not just about belonging to a club, you know, <laughs> with a certain name and with a certain number of monasteries under its wing. Um, every monastery, according to the Buddha, is uh, its own community that is entitled to make decisions and must make decisions within the Sangha there. So um, so there was no schism there over the bikini ordination at all. It's a very strong word. Yeah. Anything else on that? Yes. Julian has something. From Why do you think that the You're making me work amount that you rob is important? Surely right. the robbing is itself That's the, a good the, point. the amount shouldn't matter, really, should it? I think often in the Vinaya, in the training um training in restraint, it's often also about consequence. It's not only about intention. Hmm. Because I used to wonder that with the Vinaya. I used to think it was all about intention. The Dhamma's all about intention, right? But I think it's also about the the harm that you uh, cause for other people. And perhaps that just causes a lot more um, social unrest. And I think it may also be to do with damaging the faith of the lay people. Mm. So a lot of the Vinaya is around, again, it's not really ethical. Like, for example... I'm not well, I've got this gastric problem, so I have a few oats in the evening, which doesn't break the principle of simplicity and being no. easy to support or being, you know, it's a lot cheaper than chocolate and cheese, which <laughs> is allowed in the typhoid tradition. Um, it's very simple and bothers no one. Um, where am I going with that? So it's not ethically uh, inappropriate, and nor should it really destroy the faith of the lay people, but there are things that can for example, there may be no bad intention to, say, speak with a male um, somewhere that's a little bit more private than you realise, but it could cause doubts, and that could be harmful for lay people, mm. as in this is if you're a bikini talking to a member mm. of the opposite gender or someone identifying as, as male. Um, it could cause a doubt. And, and also, somebody might actually have uh, some kind of vendetta, or they might want to bring around... Um, yeah, yeah, a kind of uh, they might want to spoil your reputation for some reason or another. So we have to protect ourselves to some extent. So, but it, the lovely thing also about the Vinaya, and this is how I've learned it from Arjun Brown as well, is that um, even in cases where somebody seems to have robbed a lot, and there was one case in the suttas where somebody uh, saw a very bejeweled piece of cloth that was worth a fortune, and they actually picked it up in a moment of absent-mindedness, and they were convinced that they caused a disrobing offence. And the Buddha tried to get them off the hook mm. um, and asked them, you know, when you took that, did you know that it did you did it belong to somebody did it not belong to somebody and they said well I think it did belong to somebody and it was a disrobal offense and they felt terribly remorseful but then he carried on investigating and found out that actually somebody dropped it and when they dropped it they kind of relinquished ownership right. so it didn't count as a as a theft because it didn't belong to anyone anymore so there are all these um 
sort of ways to try to have see something in a compassionate lens, but there are some things that yeah do expel you from the sender, which uh, are the things that monastics have to avoid. Yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question. Well, the only other thing I would say is that you could violently rob somebody of a mm. very small amount of money. Yeah. yeah. And you could say to someone, excuse me, can I just relieve you of all that cash I've got? <laughs> So, right, yeah. right, yeah. I guess the violence would be another um, offence yeah. that yeah. would come under a disciplinary rule. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we know what's appropriate and what's not, even as as ordinary citizens. I think those things all apply to monastics as well. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a difference between the ethical rules and the um, conventions, the monastic conventions. And I think that's where Diana was mentioning earlier that those things can change over time. The conventional side, panyati rules, but not the actual, um, the ethical ones. They don't change. Yeah. Anything else from here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, are these if if uh, someone commits an offence, is it? Um, dealt with by the whole community or just by an authority figure. Right. Um, I mean, when you first uh, read the suttas, it sounded a bit as if the whole community, you know, um, got together to decide what to do about it. Yeah. But just now you said that the Buddha um, thought it through. And if oh, I okay. relate it to a, a sort of modern, you know, modern situation, then you might be more likely to um, deal with somebody in confidence Yes. rather than tell the whole Absolutely. the whole community and, yeah. and get everyone to decide yeah. whether to expel that person or, or right or right something. right very very good point you've kind of uh got that inside the way we do things there by by bringing that to light and uh i think these particular things are calling for a group for a reason because it's about settling disputes in the sangha so it's a little bit different but yeah when it's about actually confessing every fortnight the particular um, training rules that you've not been able to keep, then you do do it in pairs. You do it in pairs. So I would do it with another bikini, oh. but you're not supposed to do it with somebody who has the same offence. So, for example, when Venerable Apeka was here, if she'd happened to have some allowables in her room, say the chocolate for more than seven days, and so had I, then because you're only meant to keep it for seven days, then we, we did confess it to each other. But ideally, if you had a bigger sangha, you'd confess it to someone who hadn't done that to stop you kind of just sharing secrets. Um, but yeah, usually it's just between the two and then you you come back to the whole sangha and um, the whole sangha says, that, yeah, you say to each other that you're pure in the sense that you've revealed everything and then you come back to the whole sangha and they bring, and they do the, uh, the recitation. Yeah. Unfortunately for a lot of bikinis like myself and many bikinis, in, uh, in outside of Asia, I guess, we don't have enough bikinis to actually do these procedures in full. So we do tend to just confess together with one other person and we don't have many opportunities to chant the whole thing, to recite the whole thing, because you need four bikinis for that. Yeah. I've only done a handful in my monastic life, but then I will also talk to my bikini friends and also to Ajahn Brown very regularly uh, but that's important to know that the the uh, sangha the community of monastics is is more democratic than hierarchical and it's certainly not into shaming and blaming and all of that sort of stuff so mm. yeah but if it was a question of expelling somebody from uh -huh. a community um wouldn't that decision be made by um you know an authority figure it's or made by the, the by the rules that are left to us. So it's made by the Vinaya itself. And the Buddha said when he was um, entering Parinibbana, it's somebody asked him, you know, who's going to be your successor? Mm -hmm. And he basically said there won't be any successor. He won't appoint somebody to be the leader of the Sangha. The Dhamma and the Vinaya is your leader, so to speak. So oh, that's why we refer mm -hmm. to the text. Okay. Um, so, of course, everybody would come to know that that person had been expelled because mm -hmm. you would talk I mean the communities generally are quite intimate in the sense you're living with these people so you get to know each other's weaknesses and mm -hmm. hopefully have enough compassion not to uh, 
humiliate anybody else. <laughs> but um, it's not that everything has to be said in, in public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else from the room? We still have uh, a bit of time. We could do, is it the last paragraph? See if we can get through that. So, <clears throat> so we've done the, the three now. We've done um, the settling by presence, the settling by the opinion of a majority and the covering over with grass. Just is very beautiful. Then a wise monastic among the monastics who side together on the other part. Ah, okay, this is the same one. This is the other side of covering over with grass. A wise monastic among the monastics who side together on the other part should rise from their seat and after arranging their robe on one shoulder, they should raise their hands, palms together and call for an enactment of the Sangha thus. Let the venerable Sangha hear me. When we took to quarrelling and brawling and were deep in disputes, it's kind of reassuring, isn't it, to know that monastics can quarrel and brawl? Have you ever heard it? <laughs> I don't know, it probably wouldn't be inspiring, but it might be reassuring. Because sometimes I think as lay people, probably speaking for myself as well as a lay person, I thought that monastics were perfect, or I wanted them to be, right? So you project all these impossible standards onto them. And even if you see them getting irritated, you think, oh my goodness, they're not enlightened, you know? <laughs> Aren't you meant to get enlightened before you wear the robes? <laughs> if only, eh? If only wearing the robes, or well, maybe wearing the robes makes you enlightened, like instantly, overnight. But... Uh... <laughs> So, you know, even if monastics have a little bit of tension, most of the time they're not brawling or deep in disputes. Anyway, I just like the uh, graphic sort of imagery that it conjures up. So when we took to quarrelling and brawling and were deep in disputes, we said and did many things improper for an ascetic. It is approved by the Sangha. If it is approved by the Sangha, then for the good of these venerable ones and for my own good, in the midst of the Sangha, I shall confess, by the method calling covering over with grass, any offences of these venerable ones and any offences of my own, except for those which call for serious censure and those connected with the laity. Such is the covering over with grass. And so there comes to be the settlement of some disciplinary issues here by the covering over with grass. <laughs> I think it's rather nice that one person, I don't think it's that they have to come in front of an authority. It's more that they're actually taking the blame in a way, like they're taking leadership, aren't they, by saying, I'm disclosing all these things I've done wrong and I speak on behalf of the others too. And they're speaking in front of the whole Sangha rather than one person who mm -hmm. can tell them off. Diana has something. I think Linda as well, maybe. I'll come to you after. I'll make sure everyone gets a, a input. Hi. I I really love how this resolves with the covering over with grass where the groups of monks, you know, they this, the little group that was originally having a problem couldn't figure it out on their own. Then they go to the bigger group mm -hmm. and try to get a majority rule out of that entire group. And if they can't get a majority rule out of that entire group, then then they have two sides. Some people still think it should be like this, and the others still think it should be like that. So it's kind of like they're like, okay, we're, we're not going to settle this one. We'll agree to disagree. I, yeah. I screwed up. I confess. I didn't behave well. I was acted like a jerk. And then others is, is like, <laughs> me too. We acted like jerks. We didn't you know, act like ascetics, we were brawling. Yeah. <laughs> I just imagine them tumbling over in the dust, you know, flying. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> um, and, and then they say, it's kind of like agree to disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And focus on, go back to those common ground exactly. basics that we do agree on and, and behave ourselves going forward mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it's very mature it and is it's very realistic yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Right. yeah mature and realistic i love how you um 
sort of read the whole thing as a complete whole, mm. almost a graded sort of way of, of trying to nip something in the bud and if it doesn't work, go to the next stage and the next stage is beautiful. Yeah, it could be a, a wonderful guideline for any community. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to come to John next because he hasn't um, spoken yet. Hi. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Venerable. Lovely to be here. Um, I've been... Could you come a little bit night. closer to the computer? So yeah, can helps. you hear me? That's better. Great. I've, um, it's mm -hmm. funny we're discussing this tonight. It's great because the other night I... I started, I woke and I started to meditate and to think about the, the Sangha and about the sort of, about what's happening at Van Kampa project. And, uh, I, and then I started to, I read, and then I went on to my, to the, to the project website to understand a little bit more about what's going on. And then I, I sort of came across an article about how Ajahn Brahm standing up for the full ordination of uh, bikinis became excommunicated from his from from his um, sangha in Thailand, and this sort of I can't feel I've started I've been struggling and not struggling but been pondering upon this and and wanted some quite but feel that this is a little unfair because I do respect both yourself and Ajahn Brahm the people the only people I know so um, I just needed sort of it's brought up this question as well, so I, mm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. I know it's quite, uh, maybe it's not the, the place to discuss this here and now, because it might take a bit more, more explanation, but right. it's sort of, it, I have been pondering and sitting with it, and it had, you know, one, one time we might have a conversation about that. And sure. More. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, from my side, it's there's no problem at all. Um <laughs> <laughs> some of the stuff you might read online is quite inflammatory like you mentioned yeah. I don't know how many people actually could <laughs> hear John but he talked about reading an article about how Ajahn Brahm was excommunicated from by the Thai Sangha okay so those words are already really big and they are actually not true so the Thai Sangha is enormous and as we said a Sangha is actually the Sangha in one place so there cannot be something called the Thai Sangha um, there'll be lots and there'll be hundreds and thousands of sanghas across Thailand. Um, the other thing is the word excommunicated is kind of maybe relates more to Christian, I don't know, religion, or it could mean, I mean, real excommunication would mean a disrobal offence, so it isn't excommunication. Yeah. One of the ways that um, it's been re sort of phrased is delisted from the Wat Papong Gonsh monasteries. That's I think that's a bit better. Yeah. So he's not well, officially yeah, one of the Wat Pa Pong branch monasteries anymore. That's all. Um, but even the idea of branch monasteries, I mean, I, I'm sure it serves a purpose for the people who are part of those branches, but there's also a danger there in the sense that what if the, the head of the branch monastery says one thing and every branch, in order to keep their kind of place in that, which involves being supported through that, because there's a lot of money there. Yes. What if they all have to compromise on their ethics and values in order to stay in the branch? And I know people like this, even in the West, um, monastics who are trying to do something good and support bikinis, but they're worried, you know, about not being too visible in case they're no longer part of those branches. And I think that's very sad, actually, because they're in this kind of catch-22 situation where, you know, on the one hand, you want the support for your own community. I can understand that. And on the other hand, you want to do something slightly different. But you're afraid of losing that support. So I think it's a very difficult situation. And um, I think Ajahn and I are quite easy to talk about it because I often think when somebody makes a decision that's ethically right for them and they do it with integrity regardless of the consequences, with a sense of fearlessness and wanting to do what's right, they can live with that, even if there are material or physical or whatever, even reputational consequences. So Ajahn Brown's absolutely fine with it. I think they feel it's probably not a bad thing. Um, they're a lot more aligned now with early Buddhist teachings. In other words, they go to the text for their authority rather than the, the head monks of that very patriarchal lineage. Um, you know, and they don't even want to talk about that lineage as the Thai forest tradition because there are many Thai forest traditions. So 
it's just one particular group who who formed under a particular branch. And um, I'm sure there are all kinds of different opinions within those people. So I try not to think of them as they, you know. We're all individuals with our own uh, sensibilities and um, ethics and values. And many of them may support the Coonies, I don't know. Anyway, that was a bit long-winded, but hopefully that makes some sense. Thank you. But I can't resolve, yeah. That, I mean, I think there is still... Maybe one of the reasons there is still some disquiet and tension is because of the lack yeah. of dialogue around it. And it's very hard to to further that, it seems. It seems like something that's been not covered over with grass as so much as shoved under the carpet somehow. Yes, yeah, so and I think for, for the fruition of uh, uh, for the fruition of uh, it's hard to hear you, John. It's really I'm sorry. Hard to hear. I think I just feel that it is important that, that it, it could it could uh, hinder the the success and the and of this um, moving forward for uh, having a, a monastery here uh, for right. the coordination of women. Yeah. Is my, I mean, my concern. Right, that's sweet. Yeah, I mean, I have struggled with that in the sense that I do think it has an impact on us receiving support from some traditional Buddhist communities, maybe, who have sort of received or interpreted the message as that it's controversial to support us. But I don't think it's going to hinder or stop us. I think it just maybe slows it down. But at the same time, the people coming to us are genuinely supportive. They're coming for their own very strong reasons. Um, and so the people we have are very loyal and we are uniting around the Dhamma. People come because they're getting benefits through these groups, through these communities, these teachings. So I feel that our supporters are here to stay. I'd rather have quality than quantity. And yes, it may be slower, but I think it's here to stay. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, and we have international support. I mean... This latest property find and putting the word out has been utterly overwhelming. I mean, maybe I should just mention here for the sake of anyone else who may be interested. We have received, like, because we don't have enough to be cash buyers, so it's unlikely we can make the, the sale, the purchase. But um, if we would sell this vihara, then we'd have enough. So we told people that. And the number of people internationally that have come forward to offer loans to cover us in the interim. It's overwhelming. It's people from all over the world, from Australia, from India, from Sri Lanka, from America, from Hawaii, from Europe. Somebody offered 30,000 euro. They said they're gonna empty their bank account. It'll be all their savings, but they were in tears about how much they want to help. Altogether, we've received 450,000 pounds of loan offers within like three days. And I keep getting emails from Dama friends who don't have that much saying maybe I can sell my house and move to an apartment and give you the rest or maybe I can sell sell stocks is that right stock mm. shares don't know stock sounds like stock cubes uh, uh, and people that are just you know asking their banks what's the most we can give people that are writing to us two or three times in two or three days saying we haven't heard from you I really want to do this these aren't people that are getting pressed. These are people that really want to see this happen. So I feel so privileged and I feel like completely blown away by the fact that these people value this so much and have obviously benefited and can see the potential benefit to come. So um, I don't want to count people who are, you know, not sure about it. It doesn't matter. It's like, it's the force of that incredible commitment and support that keeps me inspired and that keeps me going. So this isn't about me wanting it. Maybe in the beginning, Ajahn Brahm and I had the idea that, you know, we need to give this opportunity to others. But now it seems to be others who are asking for that opportunity from us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so, so touching. You know, not only the loans, but we've also received more donations as well. £10,000 here, £6,000. I mean, it's a lot, you know, and I'm not, it's not right for monastics to talk about money. I'm not doing it because of that. I'm doing this because it's inspiring. You know, whether it's one pence or a hundred pounds or whatever, 
it doesn't really matter. It's just the fact that so many people are coming forward and offering the most they can give. So it's just beautiful. And it's a privilege to be a monastic, just as Liz said, it's a privilege to serve the people she serves. It's a privilege to be a monastic and witness so much generosity and goodness. It's it's mind blowing. I don't even care so much whether we, it's not even about the property. It's almost like a point around which goodness can collect, you know? It's really much better than reading the newspaper. <laughs> uh, not to dis, you know, not to say there's not terrible things going on with the, in the world, but whatever fortune we have, hopefully that can help relieve some of that suffering. So I think I've talked my head off and we've one minute left and I know that Shell wants to say a few words to end. So please do give us a couple more minutes to tell you what's coming next. Thank you, Venerable. <laughs> so um, I'm going to follow on a bit from what Venerable was just saying. So um, I did have the privilege to go and see this property with um, Venerable and Ajahn, and it literally, I had to hold back my excitement um, because it was perfect, is perfect. Um, well, with a few little niggles, but no, no way can be perfect. But this is a beautiful place to give everyone the opportunity to come and practice and to give the Bhikkhuni Sangha an opportunity to grow in the UK. Um, so it really does mean a lot um, if we were able to get this property because we've already grown out of the space in the Vihara. We had a volunteers meeting and managed to fit 17 people, I think it was, in the room. I counted in the photo, which was quite a squeeze. So it would be great for us to have more space for our volunteer meetings as well. Um, but anyways, any amount is so gratefully received. Um, obviously, Venable's just been speaking about some large amounts, but even if you can just give a pound a month uh, or three pounds for press for coffee a month, um, that would be so gratefully received. Um, if everyone did that in our mailing lists and online, we would be getting a few hundred thousand um, just there and then. Um, so if you can donate, please do. Minori's just popped the uh, link in the chat box. Uh, and this is our way of showing our generosity towards Venerable Chanda and the Bhikkhuni Sangha who are offering these teachings as generously um, as they do in, in the Buddhist traditions, they are freely given. So um, we can support and make merit by supporting the Sangha. Um, Venerable, should I mention any other ways to support the Sangha? Do you need... Um, we just keep it well, this the evening? opportunity sense shopping is also there because now that we're having more guests again, it's really helpful. Uh, not everyone has the means to go to the shops. Uh, of course, you can come for dana, like as in to offer food. Uh, you can send food the night before. We can eat it the next day. Um, you can keep coming to these talks. You can come to the retreats. You can get to know the volunteers. I think one of the reasons we have wonderful volunteers now is because they're starting to form a community in and of themselves. Like they're all friends together, so you know they keep meeting <laughs> very often, <laughs> either here or on the tours or at the teachings, and it's beautiful. And I think you know it's something that all of us need. The Buddha said that spiritual friendships are whole of the spiritual path because we are conditioned, we are influenced by everything and everyone around us. So why not put ourselves in the midst of people trying to live uh, lives with values we respect and values we aspire to? That strengthens all of us. It's like a service and a gift to ourselves. So there are some other ways and also the teachings that are coming up. Um, so what are the teachings? There's a New Year retreat that's only just been open for registration. Three days that gives you still, it ends on the 30th, so you still have like, all of New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, I think they've started changing it so that people want the New Year's Eve, you know, <laughs> with family, which is fair enough. So that's there. That can also be joined online. Um, and there's loads of other stuff when I finally get out a newsletter. Uh, it's on the website as well. So, yeah. Can I just mention as well, Venerable, so um, many of Venerable's teachings next year, uh, particularly a lot of the ones in the UK for the Insight uh, Day retreats, they're going to be accessible online. So everyone that's joining us internationally will be able to sign up. The Sheffield one you can already sign up to online. Um, and then there's ones with London, Oxford and Bristol Insight meditation next year, and they'll all be accessible online too. So you don't have to come all the way to the UK to uh receive venerable teachings 
<laughs> please do <laughs> you can if you wish and if you have the means that's the two things, ways that you can be reborn somewhere you like you have to have the wish and the means that means the good karma <laughs> great all right thank you so much everybody and uh yeah we'll wave goodbye we can unmute you now i'll see some of you at the retreat next week which is lovely at least uh kareem and i think only kareem <laughs> yeah, yeah and raz raz is there yeah he's coming too that's great